Diabolical Tales. Starring Jack Ferguson and another exciting story of dangerous intrigue, fantastic adventure, and sinister circumstance. Diabolical Tales. Many of the incidents in the story you're about to hear are based on the actual experiences and authentic records of NSA Operative 132, who for many years has investigated the men from within the Earth. Here is our star, Jack Ferguson, as Operative 132. My name is not important, but you can call me Operative 132, or just O-132. I work on an above top secret project called Agartha. And this is my story. In a moment, listen for Jack Ferguson as Operative 132, Government Man. But first, a word from our sponsor. Yo, it's Friday night, and I'm Werewolf Dicky here at Waiting Room Records in Normal, Illinois. And I'm just trying to figure out why this place is hop, hop, hopping. Hey, lady, why are you shopping here? Well, I used to buy my records at the Woolworths, but I couldn't always find what I wanted. I can find them all here because the whole store is just for records. That's right, lady. Hey, Chief, what about you? Why are you shopping here? Waiting Room Records has more 12-inch long playing records than I've ever seen in my entire life. And they've got 78s and 45s, too. You who you're right, too. Waiting Room Records is at 113 West North Street in beautiful Uptown Normal, Illinois. So when you're in Normal, visit Waiting Room Records. Tell them where Wolf Dicky sent you. And don't forget to ask for Babs. That's me. And now, Diabolical Tales. This above-top-secret report from Project Agartha is marked The Automat Encounter. This is Operative 132 of the U.S. Government's National Security Agency to Agent 40. We believe we have located the man from within the Earth named Xanth. He's at a flop house near the intersection of Ingram Street and Georgia Avenue Northwest in Washington, D.C. We are converging units to that location in an attempt to hunt him down. Your assistance is needed. 0132 out. Are we good? Would they hear that? All good, Operative 132. If they didn't hear it, then we don't have anything to worry about. Are you sure that will trick the men from within the Earth, 0132? Pretty sure, Agent Cooper. Let's get a cup of joe. The date was Saturday, June 20, 1953. After our April encounter at Amalgamated Technologies with the mysterious man from within the Earth known as Xanth, we'd been wandering around aimlessly in a vain search for him, without success. In the past year, the NSA has intercepted strange transmissions from the underground civilization known as Agartha to its agents working on the surface. So after months of futile hunting for Xanth, I finally decided to take a chance by transmitting a false message on the same channel we previously intercepted the Agarthan transmissions on. We know they'd hear this and take note. Hopefully, Xanth would reveal himself and they'd fall right into our trap. Say, 0132, who's Agent 40? Agent 40 is nobody, Agent Cooper. It's an old OSS espionage trick. We used it during the war. Oh. We've gotten no response so far. If anything changes, we'll let you know. Thanks. I knew it was a dangerous risk to transmit a message on that channel, but it could help us track down this man in black. So now that we've set the trap, we just have to see if this Xanth character would take the bait. So where to now, O-132? You know the drill, Agent Cooper. We're going to be sitting in a car, but this time with backup. Now the trap was set. It was just a question of waiting. 
and waiting. And waiting. <sighs> I hate stakeouts. Uh, at least we got some Joe. I should have brought a newspaper. Uh, all you need to know is Stalin is still dead and it stinks to high heaven and sing sing right now. What? You mean the Rosenbergs? Yep. That's exactly what I mean, Agent Cooper. Yeah, I guess it would stink. Our plan was this. We had three cars with federal agents, plus several disguised as bystanders, all within 200 feet of the corner of Ingram Street and Georgia Avenue. Two blocks out from that, we had another five cars with more guys. And within a five-block radius, we had another ten cars, plus regular D.C. police standing by. Once we saw the man in black, we were going to confront him, and when he tried to get away, all our units would converge on the area. No escaping this time. We've never captured one of them before, and I intended to take him alive. If he takes the bait. Aside from normal-looking American citizens and government employees, we didn't notice anyone wearing all black. After a few hours, I saw one of the FBI agents walking from his hidden location over to our car. Hey, Cooper. Is this thing happening or what? Last I heard, this was an above-top-secret operation, Agent Wilson. Please go back to your undisclosed location. Jeez, you ought to be back on a real detail, Agent Cooper. Not this silly kind of baloney. <sighs> Don't mind him, 0132. He's an idiot. Yeah, well, we're the ones that are going to be looking like idiots if our suspect doesn't take the bait. Well, I knew it was a big risk to try this. Let's give it another half hour and we'll have to call it. Sound okay to you, Agent Cooper? Well, okay. I mean, we could go another couple hours just to make sure. Oh boy, Assistant Director Smith. Is this operation really happening, Operative 132? I've got a lot of guys out here who could be doing real work right now. We were just discussing that, Assistant Director Smith. And what did the above top secret brains behind this operation discuss? That we'd probably need to release the backup for this, and Agent Cooper and I can continue the surveillance on our own. Oh, so this was just a fire drill. Great. Thanks for the exercise, Operative 132. It's not meant to be an exercise, Assistant Director Smith. This is an operation. Didn't realize J. Edgar would have an interest in Flophouse stakeouts. You're the one who requested backup. What did you expect? A bunch of NSA guys? This is a domestic operation, therefore under the jurisdiction of the FBI. And Agent Cooper, you let me know when you're ready to go back to real work. All right, boys. Let's wrap it up. It's a bunch of malarkey, I tell you. It's a mumbo jumbo. Well, sometimes you gamble and lose. We'll stay here all the same, just in case. Your enthusiasm is addictive, Agent Cooper. But really, you should go home to Kate. I think I made a mistake. Overplayed our hand tonight. I don't believe it, 0132. I know they heard your message on that channel. I don't doubt it, Agent Cooper. But we don't exactly know their level of intelligence. Or of counterintelligence. I'd say the lack of intelligence. They might be a little behind on the times. Nevertheless, let's call it a day. Go home to Kate. I'm sure she'd rather have you there than wasting your time here. It's no waste, boss. It's a measure of national defense. You can say that again. I needed to place an unscheduled call to General Burton in order to head off any interference FBI Assistant Director Smith might try to put into this mix. Operator, what number, please? Butterfield, 35768, please. Looking for furnace repair. Can I wait until tomorrow, or is this an emergency? Pilot light is out, but there's oil in the tank. Okay, hold on. Burton here. 0132 here, General Burton. I understand you had some trouble tonight, Operative 132. No trouble. And that's the problem, General. But, uh, FBI Assistant Director this Smith... This is an unsecured line, 0132. Save it for your report. 
anything else. Well, I, I guess not, General. Sorry to bother you. Have a good night, 0132. You too. Nothing more to be done on this assignment for the night. Time to head for home myself. Well, my apartment, I mean. Yeah. Home is, uh... Home is long gone. This Xanth was proving to be a harder target to track than Zong ever was. But what if there were more? More saboteurs and assassins moving about and operating within the borders of the United States? And what of other places around the world? Do they have ongoing operations in Europe? Perhaps within the Soviet Union? Huh. Many questions. And I didn't have the ability to find all those answers. Well, I was less than a mile from my apartment, so I opted to walk. And think. Sometimes that's what they pay me to do. So here we go. No, wait. I left my car back there. Yeah. Gonna have to drive. We'll be back with Operative 132 in Diabolical Tales after a word from our sponsor. Hello, my name is Gerald R. H. Nichols Esquire. I'm the executive director of the regional Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, and it gives me a great deal of satisfaction to highlight an outstanding shopping center in Kansas City, Missouri. The Country Club Plaza Shopping Center it is a concrete expression of the practical idealism that has built America. When you visit this fine shopping center, you'll find beautiful stores, a sparkling assortment, an attractive atmosphere, and of course, plenty of free parking for all the cars that we capitalists seem to acquire. Who can help but contrast the beautiful, the practical settings of the Country Club Plaza Shopping Center in Kansas City with what you'd find under communism? Breadlines, starvation, no freedom of speech, no choice in politics, no religion. Instead of the Country Club Plaza Shopping Center, a cold, oppressive, atheistic society with no choices at all but absolute and complete hopelessness. So, for the sake of your country, please make the extra effort to visit the Country Club Plaza Shopping Center in Kansas City. And now we're back with Jack Ferguson as Operative 132 in Diabolical Tales, Project Agartha. There I was, a little despondent over a failed operation. An operation to track down the mysterious Xanth the Feared, who we encountered twice before in the past six months. Nothing happened, so I sent everyone home. But now all I could think about was how hungry I was, and how I could use a fresh cup of joe. Then I remembered there was an automat across the street from my apartment. So after parking my car in my usual spot in the alley behind my apartment building, I walked across the street and into the fluorescent lighted automat. These places were hyped up in the late 30s and early 40s as a solution to meals on the go. Nowadays, they're mostly a dying breed, but I do appreciate a piece of key lime pie after a long day, regardless of whether it was made today or yesterday or even the day before. It's pie all the same. Now if I could just find the key lime pie. Beef stroganoff, chicken a la king, pork fritters. Aspics, shrimp surprise. Shrimp, cubed ham, and peach slices in a gelatin mold. I I don't know if it's some kind of future age thing or what, but I don't understand the need to put real food in a gelatinous mold in order to consume. Okay, now desserts. White cake, chocolate, coconut, pies, apple pie, cherry, blueberry. 
What, no key lime pie? Guess I'm gonna have to go with a strawberry rhubarb pie instead. And a newspaper, like Agent Cooper mentioned earlier. Washington Post, nightly edition. Main story is the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg execution at Sing Sing, as expected. Better dead than red, I guess. Hmm, interesting. On page six, there's a local DC story about amalgamated technologies assisting the Atomic Energy Commission with an engineering issue related to the new hydrogen bombs. Huh. So the story of James Moore, CEO, seems to check out. Well, this pie is actually really good. I should come here more often. My wife Diane used to make strawberry rhubarb pie only slightly better than this. And where is she now? Off with Dave and his bongos on some quest for self-enlightenment, while the rest of us slave away to protect capitalism and democracy against all the nefarious powers aligned against us. All our enemies in the USSR, the East Bloc, outer space, and from within the Earth. This damned strawberry rhubarb pie is smacking reality right in my face. And then I remember there's no one waiting for me in my apartment across the street. Just me and my routine. What? What have I given up? Just as I was about to finish off my strawberry rhubarb pie, I looked up to see that he had entered. The man from within the earth that we set the trap for. It was Xanth the Feared, as he called himself. And this giant hulking beast was standing right in the doorway of an otherwise empty automat, holding his electro incinerator at his side. Instantly, my hand crept to my holster when... Do not bother with your primitive weapon, surface dweller. I have you covered. I don't know. I'm a pretty fast shot, man in black. If I wanted to kill you, Operative 132, I would have done so already. But I thought it was your mission to kill me. If it was up to me, Surface Dweller, you'd already be dead. But things change. He took a few steps into the automat, and I took the opportunity to stand up and swiftly pull my M1911 standard issue sidearm in the same movement. I took aim at him as he activated his weapon, ready to fire. I will not warn you again, surface dweller. Lower your weapon. I will not be killing you tonight. Okay, so if you're not here to kill me, what then? Part of my mission, surface dweller. We will sleep. Somehow I doubt I'm gonna sleep. Tell me, who is Zajim? With each statement, he was drawing ever closer to me. I shuffled a step to the side in response. Zajim is not your concern. Tell me where your General Burton lives. Try the Pentagon, man in black. Perhaps. Did you follow me here, or...? I have known where you live for months now, Operative 132. I see. <laughs> well then. A little old lady came in through the door. I didn't see her approaching as my eyes had been on Xanth. Oh my! But Xanth didn't take his eyes off me, completely ignoring her. Just then, more movement caught the corner of my eye as... Both of you drop your weapons now! A beat cop busted in through the door with his gun raised at both of us. Xanth continued staring me down, inching ever closer. He was less than five feet away by now. Officer, I work for the National Security Agency. I'll show you my credentials when I have a free moment, but I need you to get this lady out of the building now. I noticed that Xanth slightly turned his head to get a view of what was happening behind him. So I raised my gun and aimed right for his head, but then I felt him crash into me, knocking me to the ground. What did I say? Stop moving! Somehow, Xantha knocked me to the ground and killed the cop. I was starting to pull myself back up when I felt Xantha's electro incinerator pulsing behind the back of my head. Until next time, surface dweller. 
And just like that, I was out. Just like the last time I was stunned by one of those electro incinerators, I survived, but with a terrific headache. I woke up to see more police in the automat, taking notes from the old lady. Xanth was nowhere to be seen. Hey, he's awake. You gonna be okay, sir? Yeah, I'll be fine, officer. So, you got a few minutes for a few questions. I know you're a high-level G-man, but we've got a man down here. Yeah, I'll give you a few minutes. All right, good. So, uh, why don't you tell me what happened here tonight? Of course, I told the cop that we were attacked by a communist spy who stole some of our atomic secrets. The usual cover. So my third encounter with Xanth the Feared made me realize that I now had to assume I was being followed. I needed to avoid routines, never exit a building the way I went in, never park in the same spot, and my apartment was obviously compromised. So I would move every night. I would find 30 motels and hotels in the area and move randomly among them. At least until we finally got a lid on this thing. Yeah, this was just temporary. This is Jack Ferguson. Some of the stories we bring you are so strange and fantastic that it's hard to believe that it really happened. For obvious reasons, some of the names, dates, and localities have been changed. But our stories are based on the real-life experiences of Operative 132, G-Man. And they did happen here. We hope you'll join us again next time for another adventure. Until then, remember folks, the men from within the Earth are among us. This episode of the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour starred Jack Ferguson, Brian Bedell, Stuart Moyer, Kyle Stroud, Kim Elkhorn, Megan Innes, Molly Dill, Christian Wheeler, Josh Morrow, Luna Alcorn, Bill Stern Sr., Brandon Kane, and Adeline Tevis as the little old lady. The original score was by Troy Sterling Neese. The mix was by Dan Jeremy Brooks of Apocalypse Cow Studios. It was written by Brandon Kane and produced by Christian Wheeler, Troy Sterling Neese, Don Guerin, and Dan Jeremy Brooks. The Diabolical Tales Radio Hour is presented by Cosmic Control Productions. I'm Brandon Kane, the writer and director of the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour. While our show is a lot of fun to create, each episode costs a lot of time and money to produce. So if you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour on your preferred medium in order to catch new episodes as they're released. And if you have the means, please consider donating to our show at patreon.com slash diabolicaltales. Patrons will help us continue to produce the show, and will also give you access to bonus materials and additional content. You can also find us at diabolicaltales.com, and thank you for listening to the Diabolical Tales Radio Hour. Thank <laughs> you.